。多謝曬方小姐。第二個就係、是、誒、呃，我諗其實咧，我哋好欣賞皮力先生介紹誒 u n i s e 嘅一個 collection。我諗冇香港人咧係要反對嘅。不過問題咧就係、是、當嗰個 foundation 咧要捐誒、呃、千幾幅畫咧，而 Empress 咧回購四十七張咧，我哋要考慮就係嗰四十七張係咪真係咁 worth 咯？因為係咪依個 condition 先可以做一個、呃、捐贈呢？嚇、啊，點解捐贈唔可以唔使回購呢？嚇、啊，回購嘅過程裏面，我哋要反思就係嗰一千幾幅係咪等同嗰四四十七幅嘅 Empress 嘅回購作品呢？嚇、啊，呢、這個問題係咪俾皮力先生去回答㗎？ Who would you like to have answer this question, sir? As far as I see, there are basically two questions: Are the works worth the sum we paid, which was 179 million Hong Kong dollars to be exact?、Um, well, in a way, when you buy works for an art museum, I think that I mean we we try to refrain from talking about. Money and values, because what happens when a work enters the collection is, of course, that they become worthless. They will never go out on the market again. So they lose their commercial value, and they just keep their their artistic and social value as a resource for society. But since、uh, the question came up, and it has come up before, the only way we could assess that was that we could go to one of the leading experts in valuation of artworks. Those who evaluate、uh, contemporary Chinese art most frequently. In this case, it was one of the auction houses. It was Sotheby's in Hong Kong, together with their London office, who、uh, evaluated not only the 47 works but the、uh, entire collection. And we paid <coughs> their valuation, which is、uh, considered being a conservative valuation. Uh, was uh, for the works we acquired, 147、uh, was 179. Uh, million Hong Kong dollars, and <clears throat> the、uh, valuation of the donation 1.3 billion Hong Kong dollars. So, in a sense, whether it was good value or not, it's definitely good value for money. I would say the ratio is about we paid about 12 percent for the total collection of the estimated value. Now, the question, the second part of the question was, did we have to do this? I think this is a model that has become more and more common among、uh, in 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 the context of big major donations. When、um, I mean, I can list at least three of the largest donations. None of them actually of the caliber of the SIG donations. This is probably、um, at least、uh, this year's most major amazing event in the international global art world was the donation of the SIG collection. I, th- I can show. We have press clippings like this, this, this much、uh, about it, and it's all celebrations. And basically, what happens if you're a collector and you're known? You've said a few times that, oh, one day the collection will go to a museum. It will go to China. You will be chased around the clock by the world's leading museums, which was the case in with Uli Sig. And museums have a tendency to work like this, especially the Western museums. That they want more, they want collections. They have 50 people only, sort of chasing collectors to get donations. A donor wants a commitment from a museum. They want to be certain that this museum actually wants this specific collection, not just anything they can get. And one way to sort of create a threshold for the museum is to say that, okay, you actually have to make a commitment yourself. And let's say this group of work, or this percentage of the collection, and they come to the conclusion in different ways. We ask you to pay this, to make your commitment, to show. And usually, this sum is a big sum for the museum, but it's small portion of the total value of the collection. The most well-known case is, is、uh, the Giuseppe Panza uh, uh, donations slash. Uh, sales to first the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles and later the Guggenheim Museum. It's the Anthony Doffe donation slash sale to、uh, Tate and the National Gallery of Scotland. And the third is the Bergruen collection in Berlin of classic、uh, modern art. And I mean, all these were they basically paid about 20, 22 percent of the total value of the collection. And this is a 
when, it's, when, when you're talking about something that is so amazing, of such an unusual scale, then this is a model that has been used a lot. And for us and for um, the West Kowloon board and so, this was actually not an issue. But we did check very carefully, and as, as well as we could check, that actually what we paid for these specific 47 works was uh, fair market value, or actually slightly below fair market value. So that's, I think, my answer. First of all, um, Maybe we should have a few I think it's fair questions. that we open the floor to other people who may have questions that we have a limited time this evening. Um, may I ask this gentleman raising his hand? Thank you. My name is Cassius Taylor-Smith of Giant Communications. Um, I have a question for Lars about the architecture and particularly your uh, competition process, which you'll have the shortlist for soon. Um, it seems in some ways the collection is the hardware of M+, and the, the architecture as the physical embodiment uh, to convey it for the artists and for the public is a kind of software of sorts. Um, and that's why I think it's a museum of a very different type, one that doesn't have a precedent around the world necessarily. Um, and how do you see it, uh, or how, how do you expect the architecture of it to be flexible and adaptable enough as a museum for the 20th and 21st century as the visual art that it contains may change? Well, I think, the, the, I think the first thing to remember immediately is what I said also, that the building is just part of the museum. It's sort of one aspect of how the, how the work meets, meets the public in a sense. But of course, it is a big challenge because most, most museums that I think there is a general understanding among, among, especially among museum people, that they are great museums, great museum buildings. They're usually built for one type of material the De Menil Museum in Houston, or the Bayler, or whichever you want to pick, that, that people say, oh, that's a great museum. It's usually for a very specific type of work, certain period, uh, a certain uh, generation, and so forth. And of course, in this case, we have multiple disciplines or types of material. We have uh, works from, I mean, Hong Kong works are typically much smaller scale and more conceptual or more intimate in various ways than, say, mainland Chinese art, for example. And then, of course, you have design, architecture, moving image, which asks for both probably spaces that can be like the traditional spaces, but also have uh, be accommodating and be, be flexible and be able to house things we can't even imagine now because we're also building for the future. And I think the challenge is to create a building which feels like a whole, in which you can read and navigate in, but still has a variety of different types of spaces that can actually can house different types of material. And of course, we are looking for a genius or a group of geniuses to do this because I don't think the, that doesn't, I mean, there is no existing role model. I think you can put together a number of, of different museums and you would end up with some good solutions and you will have to add a few other solutions as well that aren't invented yet. So I don't have, I mean, I don't have the solution. We wouldn't even almost have to have the competition then or bring in the architect. So I think that that's as far as I can answer you right now. I don't know how relevant it was, but to some point. I believe the gentleman in, on the third row in the middle has a question. I'm, I'm an architect. My name is Colin Fournier. I'm a professor at UCL in London and at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I have a question actually for all three of you, uh, but I'm, trying to, I'm going to artificially divide it between the three. Uh, my first question uh, addresses the issue of popular culture. I'd quite like to know what you mean by that. Uh, obviously, there are some potential overlaps with moving image, with visual arts, with design. Uh, what actually do you define as being popular culture? We heard the word cartoon earlier, which I understand is one component, but it, it, clearly it's not a definition of high art versus low art or pop art. It's, it's something else, but you haven't elaborated on that. I'd be interested in that. The second question also concerns last, actually, which is uh, your very interesting mention of the jukebox idea. The, the, uh, the archive, the, the storage, which actually has uh, random access 
uh, on the basis of a non-mediated, non-curated access using robotic intelligence to go and retrieve the pieces. I like that idea very much. There are, of course, some precedents of this, not many. Mm -hmm. uh, is it in any way your intention that the storage of the art uh, collection should, uh, should indeed be something which could be accessible and recombinable by the audience in some way through that kind of sort of metaphor of a jukebox? Uh, my, my next question concerns the second speaker. I was, I was very, very fascinated to actually begin to understand what the SIG collection is about. I, I frankly d did not really know, uh, not only so much its extent, but also its content. I find it, of course, this is a political question. I find it, of course, very intriguing that a lot of the work is coming from radical groups, from underground groups, from groups which were, in a way, forbidden to, to, exp to show their art for many years. Uh, and so that political question is maybe not the venue to ask it, but uh, clearly uh, you are at the edge or, or the center of the, of the Chinese territory. And uh, in what way does this, the growing collection and the importance of the SIG collection and its radical nature, in what way is this received by mainland China? And is this something that is a, a subject of conversation amongst you? Uh, obviously, there, is, there must be already a very powerful aura of radicalism associated with this collection. Now, you may not be able to answer that question. Maybe I shouldn't ask it. But it's a key question, I think, in terms of the, I think it's very exciting and challenging that that is going to be the starting point of your collection. My third question towards the third speaker uh, these, is this These are do... many questions. This is like five now. Or well, you, you spoke for so long. No, there's yeah. only three of them. <laughs> That's true. But my last question is just uh, concerning education. I, I find it fascinating that you are putting so much emphasis on education and to quote you, to put it at the core of a museum. Now, I come from an educational establishment where it's not a matter of putting exhibitions at the core of. They are at the core of. And the way we work is that at the end of the year, we have an end-of-year show, which is basically work of the architectural students coming straight off the press. It's not mediated in any way. It's right there. It is actually what is the essence of the institution. So my question is here, would you in any way envisage the museum being also a experimental art school where work is being produced in situ, not just in the conventional way of artists in residence, but actually really a school, really an educational establishment that is producing work, and the work without any mediation then actually becomes visible on the platform. Uh, and then the, the idea associated with this, and just my last point, it's not so much a question, is that I'm very interested in the issue of communication and openness. At the same time, there are artists who are lone wolves <laughs> uh, and difficult and not particularly keen to communicate. They are laconic. I mean, take mm. you know, somebody like, like uh, John Cage was an extremely good communicator, but somebody like, like uh, Duchamp was not particularly easy you know, to extract him as an educator. And so what, how do you deal with, with artists who may not be particularly willing to communicate so generously with the public? It's a bit it's a facetious question. The other ones are more serious. Who would like to go first? Uh, I mean, maybe we should try to address the popular culture one. I think that, I mean, first of all, we have to, I think we, we all agree that popular culture is a category or a, or a concept of a different character than, than the ones we know as design, architecture, or, or, and so forth, which are sort of sidelined in a different way. And I think it's, we use it more as a marker, as a reminder that actually rather the split between what is called popular culture and sometimes even uh, in a simplified way uh, high and low culture is, I mean, it's much more fluid in our part of the world than, than it is typically in the West where it's still strict where things go. I mean, compartmentalization and cultural compartmentalization is basically a Western and mainly European sort of activity that we, we sort of have been protecting very carefully. And I think it's more, I see it more as a marker but I don't, uh, maybe, Jung, if you have something to add to that, I don't know. Just yeah. to, to bring Jung Ma into the dialogue. Hi, um, well. I'm going to speak in Cantonese, actually, so maybe you want to put on your headset in case. Um, in case, I also want to go back to the so called Lao Hai Chinese culture. Actually, the last thing I said was that the Lao Hai Chinese culture is related to the Lao Hai Chinese culture. 華語音樂啦，廣東話又好，或者國語又好，啲音樂咁其實佢哋嗰方面好多，譬如佢哋嘅，我諗而家
大家可能比較少留意啊，即係 C D 嘅封面嘅設計咁樣。咁嗰啲係設計一種，亦都係流行文化一種。咁其實已經可以涵蓋到其實誒、呃、兩個唔同。種類嘅，又或者電影海報上嘅設計啊，咁呢啲都係設計方面嘅。咁同埋其實如果睇翻好多誒、呃、當代藝術，其實同流,流行文化嘅影響都好深遠嘅因為流行文化某個程度上亦都係變咗係、呃、有個時間性喺嗰度噶嘛。咁譬如一個六十年代嘅歌星或者、呃、或者再、呃、可能五十年代嘅電影明星，咁佢其實係好多時候喺誒、呃、藝術上面亦都會有出現一個象徵式嘅代表。咁所以就、呃、我諗同啊～拉森提到嗰、那個佢嘅流動性嗰個關係好強烈嘅，我會咁樣覺得。Um, I hope that that helps to answer your question somehow.、Uh, second question was was about、uh, was about the、uh, sort of robot, and and of course the the picture I showed was from a, from a, 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 an inst or a A, uh, something that exists in Stockholm in the Moderna Museet, which is called the Pontus Ultian Study Gallery, which is sort of semi-curated, I would say. It, you have access to about 600 works, and they are、uh, presented on sort of walls that come to you. You call up a wall, and it could be a single work, it could be a more random, but there's some sort of level of curation in it. But it's so it doesn't have the full randomness. And I think that we would like to explore. The point between something being curated and something being、uh, left open, and see where the technology can can sort of make it possible, also where where you can meet it. And of course, technology often can you can both curate and group if if the if the sort of、uh, if the code is right, sort of say, or do it by random choice or or something like that. But this is something that we would like to to do. Probably not the entire collection. There are physical, you know, I mean, all the big installations, video works, and I mean, there are many work, types of works that are much harder to manage like this. Some are much easier. Flat works, typically, of course, of a certain scale and so forth. But it's something that we would like to explore, and we'll see how far we can go. But it's part of a, a more general. Uh, ambition to sort of break up this barrier between what's visible and what's hidden, while of course at the same time there are security issues. There are both, both, both from a conservation point of view, insurance point of view, and, and well, proper sort of theft and so forth point of view. So, so one has to balance a number of different things. So we'll see where we land in in five years. But there is an ambition in the direction you're indicating, and then we'll see how the practicalities and so will play in. OK， 嗯，关于您的那个第四第三个问题，关于稀客收藏和政治性的问题，我想从三个方面来回答。就第一点，就是中国的当代艺术跟政治的关系确实是很密切。如果我们看过去三十年的发展，它基本的一个动态是。艺术家的个体的 individual passion， 个体表达，他想从这种官方的社会主义的这种控制里面独立出来。所以这场战斗基本上是从七十年代就开始，一直到一九八九年天安门事件为终结，这是第一个阶段。那么第二个阶段就是从。八九年开始，一直到九七年，就是我们所谓的被西方所了解的中国的抗议的这个艺术，逐渐从被西方接受到市场上卖出很高的价格出来。这是一个在国际化情景下表表现自己的政治的抗抗争。第三个阶段就是九十年代末期，艺术家开始发现。这种国际化和商业化是一起来的，所以他们开始做各种各样的实验，比如说 performance 行为艺术，比如说摄影，比如说 video。他们通过做这些很难当时看来很难被商业化的媒介，来形成另外一种政治化的抗争。当然，两千年之后，这种政治化的抗争变得很隐隐。隐晦，他转向关注这种 urbanization 都都市化的这样的一些问题，我觉得这个是很有意思的一些倾向。那么抗争是他的一方面，但另一方面，中国当代艺术也是处在一个。不断的跟国际艺术去对话的一个过程当当中，所以他们并不完全是对社会主义的资源进行批批批判，他也会使使用，比如说政治波普 （political pop） 里边会用到 culture revolutionary 文革的一些图图像，比如说在后来的装置里面，近几年中国艺术家在谈论。
，作为一个当代艺术家，如何使用他社会主义的生存经验的问题。所以这些方面都是我们未来在 M Plus 从视觉文化的角度要来进行研究的。我想这个是一这个很重要的一一点。那么第二点就是您谈到中国人怎么样接受这一批艺艺。的艺术，那么像从两千年开始，随着大批在国外受过教育、学习过或者在国外有生意的这些人回到国内之后，这批从国外回来的年轻的企业家或者律师什么，他们成为新的收藏、欣赏、接受中国艺术的主主体。所以我觉得在意意识形态上面，他们是跟当代艺术有一种很亲近的一个态度在在里面。那么从官方的角度来说的话，其实，从经过了两千零一年之后，中国官方的态度变化是很大的。两千零一年之后，我们官方急于要加入 WTO， 所以想证明我们在文化上是很开放的。所以，基本上从政治上面来来说，除了到了零九年和一零年，除了某些艺术家或者跟法轮功什么有有有关系的这一些艺术，会受到展览的展览时候会受到一些禁止和取缔之外。大部分带有批判视角的艺术，基本上是能够展览的。但是，所以，但但是，实实实际上，这还是存在着这种当代艺艺术和社会主流意识形态这一种很潜在的一种对抗的张力性的关系，所以这很有意思，也是我们未来在研究视觉文化时候会谈到的一些问题。谢谢。Thank you for that. It's um. Thank you. Your turn. 我諗我要好簡單啦，因為時間已經差唔多啦。咁誒頭先關於誒、呃、比較 experimental 嘅一啲嘅 art course 啦，咁當然我哋梗係有諗過呢一個嘅範疇啦。頭先我喺我嘅 presentation 裏面呢，都有講到，譬如話我其實亦都希望呢，我可以誒、呃、拓闊誒一啲即係譬如唔同教育活動嘅一啲嘅形式啦，或者係方向啦。特別係喺藝術家裏面呢，其實已經好多藝術家呢，都用緊一啲誒好好強嘅一啲嘅教育元素啦，喺佢哋嘅創作裏面。頭先譬如我舉嘅例子係譬如話白雙全喺我之前。嘅展覽裏邊啦，咁亦都話，如果可以舉其他例子，譬如話誒，可以諗到，譬如倫敦啦，喺 h a y w o o d Gallery， 其實佢哋都做咗一個叫 Wide Open School， 亦都係一啲好有趣、好實驗性嘅一啲誒，即係我哋可以叫做係啲即係 Events of Learning。咁當然我哋都係好希望可以嚟緊可以做一啲唔同形式嘅一啲嘅活動啦，係喺俾到唔同類型嘅觀眾啦，特別係喺呢方面嘅。At this time,、um, I would like to let you know that we've actually gone past our time, so we'll take one more question from the floor. And I see a gentleman standing up, raising his hand on behalf of the lady. Ah, you are. I am Chou Jing. Ha. Then I am a Taoist worker. I have been waiting for so long to ask this question. Because I heard your presentation and the floor plan, I found that there is no Taoist museum. 誒、呃，如果我哋去到世界各地嗰啲城市咧，都會有陶瓷館嘅。咁但係似乎到目前為止，我冇聽過你哋提即提過依樣嘢咯。嚇、啊！誒，呢個問題你想係邊個回答 ？I think I can. I can at least start answering.、Um, well, since we are actually a museum of visual culture, so、uh, we will embrace both. What we call, what is often called art, it could be in any kind of material. What might sometimes be called、uh, design or architecture, or might even sometimes be called craft. I don't think we, we, that's going to be a distinction. I think it's highly likely that things that are called art, or whether the the, the person who makes the work thinks of him or herself as an artist, or thinks of him or herself as a designer, or as a craftsperson. Would be collected and would be displayed, and it's not a matter of well, we don't know the floor plan yet. That's not defined, but it's not a matter of of the character of the space. We will definitely see to that we have the right spaces for any type of material within visual culture. And to me, clearly, things that are made out of ceramics belong just as much as to visual culture as things that are painted with oil paint on canvas. So, you're not excluded. I promise. 好多謝阿 Lars 嘅誒回答啦。咁誒喺呢一個時間咧，我要誒或者多謝各位誒咁熱烈嘅發問啦。咁誒亦都希望咧十二月再見到你哋誒再嚟臨我哋第三個公眾論壇。I'd like to thank everybody for their time this evening, and we look forward to seeing you in December for the third M Plus Public Forum.、Um, have a great evening.